Hey, what's going on, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Just real quick, I'd like to plug my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music, a book that talks about the many reasons why music education turns kids off and fosters unhealthy attitudes towards music. You can get updates on the book by joining my email list at NikhilHogan.com. Also, if you're a fan of the show, do consider becoming a supporter on Patreon for free goodies, music tutorials, and access to our private Facebook group. Thanks again, and let's get to the show. On today's show, I'm so thrilled to talk to one of the most important music educators around, the great composer and music expert, Dr. Robert Greenberg. We talk about his early years in music, his training in music composition, many interesting perspectives and anecdotes on music history, his stellar work on the great courses, his music, and so much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show, the show where we talk to the best musicians in the world and have deep, insightful conversations about music. It's my pleasure to introduce my guest today, the illustrious composer, pianist, music expert, Dr. Robert Greenberg. Dr. Greenberg has composed over 50 works for a wide variety of instrumental and vocal ensembles, and his works have been performed all over the world. A Steinway artist, Dr. Greenberg has also received many other honors, including three Nicola Di Lorenzo Composition Prizes and a Kusevitsky Commission from the Library of Congress. He has been profiled in various major publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Inc. Magazine, and the London Times. Dr. Greenberg is popularly known for his over 550 lectures recorded for the esteemed education company, The Great Courses, including popular courses such as How to Listen to and Understand Great Music, How to Listen to and Understand Opera, Great Music of the 20th Century, and many other great ones. Dr. Greenberg, it's so great to have you on the show for the first time. Thank you so much, Nikhil. Well, you know, you come from a musical family yourself. Your grandmother graduated from the New York Institute of Musical Art, which eventually became Juilliard. Eight years later, eight years after she graduated. So she was very proud of that, and she lived in New York and got a lot of mileage out of it for the rest of her life. <laughs> Did she know, I mean, in New York City, wasn't that like a haven for classical musicians at the time? Well, it's always been a haven for classical musicians, but particularly in the... Uh, in the four or five years after she graduated. She graduated in 1916. And of course, the, uh, the Russian Revolution began in 1917. And a tremendous number of so-called whites, uh, those um, people associated with the lesser nobility or the aristocracy, had to leave, had to get out. Uh, their lives were in danger. And a great number of them came to the United States. And so just like what happened, uh, I'm, I'm talking here from San Francisco, just what happened in San Francisco in 1990, 91, when uh, the Soviet Union disintegrated and we suddenly filled up with all of these extraordinary Russians who were desperate to get out. So that happened, I think, in New York in 1917, 18, 19. A tremendous number of Russian uh, expats ended up in the United States, including her personal hero, Vladimir Horowitz. Uh, Heifetz uh, came to the United States at that point. Uh, Milstein, another great violinist. Yeah, a whole generation came over. And of course, you know, New York was always the the capital of our country, whether we like it or not. So she knew a lot of people. Uh, she knew a, con a composer named Howard Hansen, who turned out to be the uh, president of the Eastman School for many decades. Uh, she studied with a pianist named Joseph Hoffman, who is wow. a very, very famous Polish Oh, my pianist. gosh. These are... <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, she, you know, I mean, but those were the times. Those were the times. The, 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 the pool was much smaller. And, um, I mean, the general population pool. Let me ask you, Dr. Greenberg, about Joseph Hoffman. Now, he was a small person, or he had small hands. Did that... And that didn't stop him. It never stopped anybody at the piano. Did, have you ever seen Alicia De La Roca play... Alicia De La Roca is, a, as you might guess, a Spanish-born pianist. She died about 10 years ago, would be my guess, without you know, referring to it. She could play anything. I mean, I heard her play the Emperor Concerto uh, in concert. But her specialty, I mean, her amazing specialty was Spanish music, including Iberia by Isaac Albini, which is one of the most difficult pieces to play on the planet. Twelve uh, character pieces, which are impossible. They're impossible. In fact, he was going to destroy. <laughs> he said he got so depressed. He 
he was going to destroy the manuscript because no one could play this. And he was a fine pianist himself. Well, she learned those pieces as a teenager. She said she used to learn one a day. And uh, she was tiny, maybe four foot ten, four foot eleven. Uh, they'd have to put blocks, wooden blocks on the pedals so her feet could reach the pedals. And she had these itsy bitsy stunted little hands. And I'll tell you, her recording of the Albany is a miracle. Her recording of the Schumann Carnival, which is filled with tenths, it's a miracle. I don't know how she does it. She rolls her hands in different directions and so forth, but you can't hear her breaking the chords. So you know where there's a will, there's a way. Right. Now, that's an astonishing background. What a pedigree that you have. You started very young as well, right? Yeah, unfortunately. You know, it was something <laughs> that we were all in my family expected to do. My grandmother spent uh, 50 years teaching the kids of Queens, New York, uh, piano. And I like to say she tortured two, three generations <laughs> worth of young people, starting with my father and moving right into me. So this was an expected thing to do in my house. Did you like practicing as a young boy? No, um, I, I didn't. And I think a lot of that has to do with how I was taught. Because despite, you know, my, my father had very mixed feelings about, about the piano because he had been forced to play. And the way he got out of it was he joined the Navy at the age of 17 to escape his mother. Uh, that's never a good thing, as far as I'm concerned, to have to turn to the military to avoid piano and dance <laughs> lessons. And, uh, <laughs> and, that's what, and, that, and it just happened to be 1942. There was a war going on. So, you know, <laughs> his timing was not great as well, far as that goes. Well, you've said that your father played jazz piano. He played everything. He uh, was he was talented enough that you know he had to play the classics as as we all called them. <clears throat> but he grew up during that wonderful period of uh, of American popular song that saw the creation of the so-called American Songbook. You know the the theater and movie music of people like Gershwin and Jerome Kern and Richard Rogers and Irving Berlin, and these are all New York Jews, uh, as he was. And so it was kind of his music, his generation's music. And just like I was a Stones fan and a Beatles fan, so he was a Gershwin fan. I remember I read Joseph Hoffman's, the, uh, I think it was The Art of Playing the Piano. He had perfect pitch. Did your grandmother, does your father, do you have perfect pitch? Is it a family thing? No. No, and it's funny you mentioned that book, because I have a copy that's autographed by Joseph Hoffman. That he's my grandmother. <laughs> It, That's it's amazing. a neat little book. Yeah. It's a neat little book. You know, in the interview that you had with Larry King, which is really a wonderful interview, he whipped out a profound line, which was, Bach is generally regarded as the first jazz musician, which you said, I wouldn't argue with that at all, which I enjoyed. Could you elaborate on the spirit of that statement? Sure, I would be happy to. What I, what I got out of what Larry King was saying, and it wasn't a wonderful interview, by the way, uh, is that... First of all, in the music of the, of the Baroque, especially the instrumental music, the high Baroque, the instrumental forms are based on dance music almost entirely. And that means you tend to have instrumental genres in which the beat is very clear, very steady, and that much of the music is about manipulating that beat. Second of all, there's a huge emphasis on improvisation in the age of Bach. Any competent musician was expected to be able to sit down at a keyboard, in this case a harpsichord or a, a clavichord or an organ, and improvise based on the harmonic uh, structure of whatever piece you're dealing with. If it's a chorale, so the harmonic structure of the chorale. This is so much, but this is what a jazz player does. The only big difference might be this concept of swing, and that is the, um, the polyrhythms that are native to African music of uh, force a jazz player to be playing on two or three different rhythmic levels at once. And polyrhythm is not part of the music of the high Baroque, but improvising on harmonies, uh, going with a very steady beat, being able to create based on harmonic materials, uh, melodic materials out of your head. This is something every musician was expected to do at the time. And Bach did better than anybody. There's also a time you mentioned you worked professionally as a jazz pianist. Is that Where, where does that fall on the timeline of your chronology? Uh, from the time I was about 18 to the time I was about 25. From the time I went away to, uh, to college, I 
I made about half of my money by playing in clubs and bars. And I got involved in New York uh, when I was in my early 20s. I was working with a wonderful saxophone player named Lee Konitz. And, um, you know, I, 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 I could have gone that way. But it's a horrible life, as I discovered. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a really horrible right. life. And I imagine you had the same experience <laughs> a generation after or two generations after I did. I, you know, I'm talking about the, uh, the early 1970s now. But it was gooey and awful, and you weren't making much money, and, the, and these restaurant and bar owners are ripping you off, and you join the union, and then the union rips you off, and it's just yucky. Dr. Greenberg, was it Bizet who said, music, what a beautiful art, but what a wretched career, or something like that? Yeah, don't you know it, exactly. And, <laughs> you know, and I, didn't, I didn't want to prove my parents right. Of course, my parents reacted to my musical aspirations the way most parents do, and that is, you could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer. And then I said, why have you been giving me piano lessons for all these years? <laughs> Why are you surprised I'm going to major in music what, at a university? Well, how did you learn jazz? I mean, did you, how did you learn to improvise? Did you have a mentor at that time? Was it your dad, or did you have a teacher? No, no, I, uh, I didn't, and I wish I had. But, you know, it's an oral tradition, and uh, I, I learned by listening to records, to tell you the truth. Which records? Uh, I, I did Well, the first jazz pianist I fell in love with was Errol Garner. And in particular, his Concert by the Sea album that was made, I think, in about 1956. And it's just the most spectacular piano playing. And I just fell in I, mem I mean, I memorized every note on the album. I could, I could still sing every note on the album. And then you start imitating as best you can. And then I fell in love with Dave Brubeck, not so much for his piano playing, but for his composing. Then it was Oscar Peterson, then Phineas Newborn, and then from there, you know, everybody else, Bill Evans and, and uh, Chick Corea. Uh, Dave McKenna is a favorite of mine. Yeah, uh, I don't a very know. underrated you know, player, Dave McKenna. Oh, my God, I think he's just at the very top. Yeah. If you were in Boston, as you were, you know, I mean, that was his home turf. And people still talk about him with awe in Boston. Well, for people who don't know, Dave McKenna is, I mean, he could walk a very tasteful left-hand bass line and comp and solo all at the same time. It was ridiculous. Yeah, it was, it, he called it the three-handed technique. <laughs> he would comp his chords with the, uh, with the thumb and, and, uh, and forefinger of both hands and then, and then solo with the upper three fingers of his right hand. Um, that that three hand reminded me of um, uh, Thalberg. Yeah, Thalberg had all kinds. You know, they they all they all would kind of create their own little technique that someone else couldn't do. And uh, and I think what you're talking about with Thalberg, if I recall, he had some kind of way of playing chords that only he could play. Some kind of super rapid six. Who I was think just thinking about just now was Clementi. I'm two generations off. Clementi specialized in playing these incredibly rapid thirds and sixths and so when he competed with mozart at a very famous competition in early 1782 that's what he did he just sat down and started doing all this rapid stuff and mozart just sat there apparently looking at the ceiling thinking this is not music at all this is just gymnastics and then mozart sat down and played all the same thirds and sixths but incorporated them into a piece of music at which time everyone said, okay, <laughs> Mr. Clemente and Clemente stood up and shook Mozart's hands and, you know, I am not worthy. And that was the end of that. But yeah, this is, this is what the, you know, the piano was a contact sport. Uh, playing music was a contact sport. You used to have these, what are called in jazz, cutting, cutting contests. To, you know, you'd, you'd see who could play faster and better and slowly you'd winnow out the field. And it was, it was like an athletic event. And certainly that's not true anymore. Dr. Greenberg, for the piano battles back in the day, were there like three rounds or something, and that didn't include sight reading and improvisation and something like that? Depending, and the, the, to my knowledge, the toughest thing, the key was always, whomever was on stage would ask someone in the audience to give them a theme. And then both pianists would have to improvise on that theme that they'd never heard until that moment. And uh, Beethoven, for example, was famous for, for doing that so well that uh, he would always insist on going first because more often than not, the other pianist would sneak out the door while Beethoven was playing. <laughs> so that, it went, that when it was the other pianist's turn, they discovered that that pianist was no longer in the house. 
So yeah, there was all kinds of stuff that was involved in uh, in this in this kind of thing. You know, when Mozart was a kid, they they put a sheet over the keys, and uh, and you know, if you're not a piano player, that sounds very complicated. But of course, as we all know, you don't have to be seeing the keys to play. But for for other folks, it seemed like magic that he would still be able to play the piano or the harpsichord, as the case was. A lot of people, um, when they think of composers, they have a very idealized image of them. So for them, Mozart, Beethoven, they're almost deities, gods in a way. Let's let's talk about Salieri and Mozart. And I think it was so funny in a podcast, you referred to Amadeus, the movie, as that movie. <laughs> and I thought that was great. Salieri has been really unfairly treated in history, and maybe that movie contributed to that, right? But he was, I mean, he taught Beethoven. He taught Beethoven, he taught Liszt, he was Schubert's principal teacher all the way through Schubert's college years. He supervised Schubert's music education for like 15 years. Wow. He was, a, he was not just an important composer, uh, but also, as, as you just said, a very important teacher. Yeah, he, he taught Beethoven, he gave Beethoven vocal, uh, vocal writing lessons. And poor Salieri, I, you know, it all started uh, in, I think, about 1820. Well, it started when he went crazy at the end of his life and uh, tried to kill himself, and he claimed that he had killed Mozart. But in his moments of lucidity, because he was mentally ill, he said, of course, I didn't do that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going mad. You know, I'm, I'm just going mad. But it, the, the problem, the big problem was in the eight, late 1820s, um, Alexander Pushkin, the great, <clears throat> the great Russian writer, sat down and wrote a one-act play called uh, Mozart and Salieri, where he speculated that um, Salieri killed Mozart because Mozart was an idiot who could do this one thing. And Salieri, who had dedicated his life to music and to God, felt that he was just a mediocrity and, and that God had cursed him, and the curse was this Mozart. But it was just... Uh, it was just um, a metaphorical play. Mozart isn't even a person in the Pushkin play. He's just the one thing we all fear the most, and that is that someone is going to prove us to be frauds. It's going to prove us to be that untalented, uneducated, unintelligent person we all fear we might be. And and so so Mozart is just a cardboard character in the Salieri, and rather in the... Um, in the in the Pushkin, but then then Rimsky Korsakov turned that into an opera, and really started and really started fleshing out the story, and then Peter Schaffer wrote a Broadway play, and the original name of the Broadway play was Salieri, because again it's about Salieri, it's not about Mozart, but he changed it and called it Amadeus, then he fleshed it out, and then he wrote the uh, the script for the movie. And and then Milos Forman, the director, had to further flesh out the character of Mozart. So by the time you get to the movie, you have the untruth of the story, but projected in such a way that it seems like it might be possible. So that's why I call it that movie. I have to say, I'm asked crazy questions. <laughs> and among, well, but you know, I'm out there a lot, Nikhil, and people ask me questions. And among the questions I'm asked of... One of the most common questions I'm asked, although not so much anymore, but certainly 20 years ago, every day, um, is, is Amadeus accurate? Is that movie accurate? And then, of course, you have to say, no, it's great entertainment, but it's crappy history. And people would be so disappointed. I'd say, what do you think is going to happen when they make a Hollywood movie? Excuse me. Once you, I would say, Disneyfy a person, Mozart becomes this, like a cartoon character. But there's a quote in a letter where he said that, you know, I've worked really hard. I've studied everyone. And, you know, this didn't come so easy to me. It appears that way, but I really worked hard at this. Yes, he did. He worked like a dog. He, yeah, he was, look, he was a genius. But I hate using that word because when you say someone's a genius... Now they're not even human anymore. Now there's something else. There's something above and beyond us. Mozart, bless him, had the best music education any person ever had. His dad might have been a first-class jerk, but he gave his son the best music education anyone has ever had. He took him all over Europe and introduced him to everybody. Second of all, he 
helped his son write the music. I mean, a lot of early music that Mozart gets credit for really was written by Leopold Mozart, or the bulk of it was done by Leopold Mozart. Maybe Wolfgang created a theme here and there. But the point is, from the very beginning, he was being coached. I mean, from the age of three, he was up and out. So he had a great music education. He was incredibly ambitious. He worked very hard. He knew his worth in an era that did not value the work of artisans. But he knew that his, he knew that his talent ennobled him. He didn't allow that talent to be squashed by the Archbishop of Salzburg or his father. He took it to Vienna. And God bless him. Uh, a couple of, if a couple of things had gone different for him, he probably would have lived a long time. What was different about the music education back then versus today? I mean, today we have lovely performers who are technically excellent, but was there something different about, I mean, I've read from some from my interviews with classical improvisers, they say, you know, you have to study figured bass at a high level, you have to understand theory. Um, what was different about Mozart's education, Haydn's education, Bach's education, when they were learning music? That's all they did. They were tracked. There was no public school curriculum for, their, for them to attend. You know, it's funny, you, you, Haydn is the exception here, but let's talk about Mozart and Bach. They both went into their father's profession. They did what children did back then, children of the working class. Your, if your father was a tradesman, if your father was a butcher, you became a butcher. If your father was a metal worker, you became a metal worker. In the case of Bach and uh, and Mozart, their families. I mean, there were something like 80 professional musicians in the Bach family tree between the 1500s and the 1800s. Same thing with Mozart to the degree that this is what his father did. So it's not like they went to public school. It's not like they did anything else. They were tracked. And so if you have a tremendous talent like these Romanian gymnasts from the 1970s who were tracked from the age of three, and that's all they did growing up, then they develop a spectacular level of technique that no one else could achieve because their whole life is dedicated to it. It doesn't necessarily create a rounded human being, and someone like that could not compete in today's economic market. You have to know more than one thing in our world today. But it was a very different world, and very different things were expected from members of the working class. They weren't expected to be rounded. They weren't expected to be educated. They were expected to be able to apply their trade. And so that's what they were taught to do. How did classical improvisation fade away at the turn of the 20th and, I guess, the end of the 19th century? It's a good question. And I, I don't think I know any better than anybody else. I suspect that um, the virtuosity of the 19th century, the emphasis of, on performing in ever larger spaces, and people expecting to hear different things. I think the middle class using music increasingly as entertainment and rather than as, a, um, as, as, as an ongoing and intellectual pursuit made folks expect things to be played a certain way continuously. Certainly, the advent of recording and the advent of records pushed that even further. You're used to hearing things played a certain way, and that's how you want to hear them played. But I still don't understand. It's so much fun to improvise. I still don't quite understand why such spectacular pianists, that because concert pianists, let's face it, these are amazing athletes, amazing musicians, why they're willing not to improvise, why they don't want to have that as part of their lives. So I could posit to you the, the changing economics of the music business, the advent of recordings and the expectation that things will be played a single way. But I still can't quite figure out why musicians stopped improvising. Now, I want to switch over to the great courses, which is what you're popularly known for. And I was just thinking to myself, my goodness, if I had not spent money on, on music history in college, which is thousands of dollars, and I had just bought I just bought your course, I would have saved so much money and I would have learned <laughs> so much more. Aye. Now, I think it works because for one reason, you're a composer. So you understand. So you're not just... So musicologists approach the great composers differently from a composer. Uh, let's talk about your compositional training. You you studied under Edward Cohn, Daniel Wirtz, Carlton Gamer. Could you talk about your development as a composer during your undergraduate years and the influence of your teachers? When I look back at my teachers in college, 
I am amazed that I got anything. And that wasn't their fault. It was my fault. I came up through a big public school in New Jersey, um, in southern New Jersey, for people who don't know anything about southern New Jersey, just think about the ugliest place in the world. Think about the one place you never want to have to go. <laughs> you have just imagined where I grew up. And, you know, despite my grandmother and despite the emphasis on piano in my family, I had virtually no training when it came to music theory, uh, when it came to really knowing the repertoire. I knew piano, but I didn't know the symphonic repertoire. I didn't know the chamber repertoire. I didn't know squat. And so I went away to college, and now you've got all these amazing brainiacs, these fantastic composers, Milton Babbitt, J.K. Randall, Claudio Spies, then the people you mentioned, Colin Gamer and Dan Wirtz. And, you know, I couldn't have even framed a question for my first two years there that they could have answered. I didn't know enough to even know what questions to ask. So what I learned initially from these people was uh, a certain degree of artistic integrity. That is, whatever you do when you put pencil to paper, and in those days it was pencil to paper. <laughs> when you put pencil to paper, you have to decide what you want to write before you write it, and you have to care about every pitch, and you have to care about every rhythm. You have to listen to yourself, and you have to be willing to be critical and rewrite the gods of that music department, aside from Milton Babbitt, who was our, our local deity, the gods <laughs> were the dead Germans. The dead Germans, you're talking about Bach and, and Haydn and Mozart. I know they were Austrian, but they were German-speaking. And Beethoven, and especially Brahms, especially Brahms. And what made them the deities is that there was never a wasted note. Nothing ever done purely for affect. Everything should be explicable in terms of its theory, and it should sound good, which means rewrite, rewrite, and rewrite. That's what I got. Uh, I didn't get anything specific because I didn't know enough to ask the right questions, but I got, a sense, I got a sense of inherent professionalism. And, you know, as it turns out, that worked because by the time I was a junior, I was designated a university scholar, which allowed me to design my, the rest of my program myself. And uh, it was heavy on composition. And, and that's really, by the time I was a junior, I, I started to speak the language. And by the time I graduated, I was speaking the language. And then before going off to grad school, I taught high school for a couple of years and continued taking lessons with faculty. So that, you know, I was, I was a late bloomer. At that period, what was the trend in um, musical academia? I, I, from a previous interview I had, there was a trend towards, I guess, serialism and, and dissonance. Uh, was that part of your training? Uh, it, was not, it was never part of my training, per se. And thank goodness, uh, all of the composers I just named, with the exception of Edward Cohn, were all ultra-serialists which meant that virtually every aspect of their music was uh, preconceived uh, via various formula. Milton Babbitt somehow made it work into music. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> somehow Babbitt's music still sounds like music. But really, it, this, this, the whole serialist thing was is, is antithetical to creating music that communicates anything but the formula. Uh, but they didn't try to teach you that because you were too young. I mean, teaching an undergraduate how to write serial music is, is like sex education for a four-year-old. It's simply not appropriate. They don't have the tools to even start to comprehend what it's all about. And generally speaking, and I think this is true, even at the graduate level, those people who were still serialists by the time I got to grad school would not teach it because there was the feeling that you must, you must – Make these decisions for yourself. You have, to, you have to hear the voice in your head. You have to be drawn to whatever music you're drawn to. And then having decided this is the kind of music you want to write, then you might work with somebody who's sympathetic. But correctly so, this stuff generally is not taught because it becomes, it, it becomes almost bad propaganda. You know, you start indoctrinating students, and that's not a good idea. No one wants to be in that position. So luckily... Uh, I never had an indoctrinaire as a teacher, and there was never any demand that you learn this stuff. There's a very famous line from Arnold Schoenberg, and everyone 
who's a serialist, knew it and understood it. And that is, there's still a lot of great pieces to be written in C major. And, and it's an important thing to remember. We choose our language for ourselves. We cannot force a musical language on anybody. And by the time I was a mature composer, the serialism... And when was that? When, were you, had, when had would passed. you have considered yourself a mature composer? Uh, by the time, by about 1982. So I would have been about 28 years old. Uh, the music I started, I was writing about then, is still music that I am not embarrassed to show to somebody. Wow. And, but you've been composing your whole life, right? Pretty much? My whole life, yeah. What kind of compositions were you doing before, um, your, undergra- uh, before your undergraduate? Were you, was it uh, contemporary styles? No, it was all jazz stuff. All jazz stuff. What did your teachers think of, of that when you went into Princeton? They didn't. <laughs> I never showed it to them. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just didn't show it to them. Did you see any parallels in your training at Princeton with what you had organically done for yourself? Uh, again, I didn't know enough. I, I can't answer that because, because the work I did as an undergraduate was the kind of grunt work all undergraduates have to do. Counter, species counterpoint, counterpoint, harmony, canon, fugue. Um, you go through the Percy Gurchis is what I did, the Percy Gurchis books on, on, on musical form, which were written in the early 20th century and are still very excellent. You know, you learn how to write a theme in variations form movement. Then you learn how to write a minuet and trio. Then you learn how to write a scherzo. You learn how to run a, write a rondo. Then you learn how to write sonata form. So really, this was not free composition. It was, it was learning uh, it, it was learning technique, learning how to push notes around, learning how to balance harmony and melody, which is, of course, the key in Western music. It's what makes Western music so different from most other world music traditions is that you have this constant conflict and, and simpatico between these simultaneities, the science of harmony, and between linearities, the, the existence of melody, and then trying to balance them through this use of counterpoint or polyphony. And, you know, it's, it's hard to learn how to do that <laughs> and then to come up with a language of your own. It takes a long time. So I have to say, as an undergraduate, I wasn't grappling with any of these big issues. It was just trying to, trying to gain some, some mastery of the syntax. And that's, I think, what undergraduate years are about for a lot of people, unless you started young and were trained young. But as I said before, I didn't have any training going in. So you went to the University of California, Berkeley, and there you earned your PhD in music composition. Your principal teachers were Andrew Embry and Ollie Wilson. Could you talk about your experience there and and working with those teachers, and what did you get out of that experience? Well, it's an entirely different experience, you know, night and day between undergraduate and graduate. As I said before, I took two years off, uh, which I think, by the way, is the smartest thing I ever did in my whole life, was not go right away to grad school out of undergrad, but instead dealt with the world, uh, got to be a better piano player, kept my lessons going. And then when I went to grad school, I did it because I wanted to and not kind of as some knee-jerk reaction because this is what I got to do next. By the time I got to grad school, I knew kind of what I was doing, and I was able to write real music. Excuse me. I was able to write real music from the time I arrived. And uh, the way composition is taught at that level is that, uh, you know, you're in your pro seminar uh, with two or three other composers and as one of your classes, and you just write. You decide what you're going to write. Uh, the first thing I wrote when I got there was a, 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 a fantasy variations for a chamber orchestra. And you, you finish it as quickly as you can. You know, in this case, that piece took me about four months. Every week you go in to the pro seminar and, and the students play what they've written that week and you discuss it with the professor. If you got a good composition teacher, which I had in Ollie Wilson and Andy Embry, then you have uh, people who can divine what they think you're looking for and can help you find it. If you have a crappy composition teacher, which I did at UC, someone who I'm not going to name now because he's still alive, God bless him, <laughs> um, these people crap with your brain and and mess with you and make you feel like you're an idiot. Well, specifically, what were you working on musically? Um, how did they shape your compositions? And could you give an example of the commentary they would give on your work? They didn't shape it. What they would do, and this is what a great composition teacher has to be able to do. The teacher has to be able to divine what he or she thinks you want 
what he or she thinks you're after and has to be able to coach you and say, now, have you thought about this? Or maybe, maybe Andy Embry was someone who would get down and dirty with you. He'd say, listen, this is a lovely theme, but, uh, but the second phrase is too short. This is truncated. And he'd improvise something at the piano and say, are you hearing what I'm hearing here? We need, we need a little more time for these ideas to develop before we can go on. So, so that would be a very specific thing to address. Other things would be, listen, what are, what are, what's the dialogue you're creating here? Is this a piece of music in which there's an ongoing variational process? Are you interested in contrast? And if, the con- if you are going to introduce a contrast, what sort of contrast do you want? What kind of story are you telling? How high a drama level do you want to create? Then from a purely practical point of view, I still remember going into a lesson with Ollie once, and I had, a, I had the beginnings of a piece of music. It was a trio. And, uh, and I'd written mezzo piano in the first measure. He says, what does that mean? I said, it means mezzo piano. He says, what do you mean it means mezzo piano? He said, I know it means mezzo piano. What do you think the player's going to play? I said, mezzo piano. He says, no, the player's not going to play mezzo piano. The player's either going to play piano or forte, because mezzo piano doesn't mean anything. It means middle <laughs> piano. It's an entirely relative term. Yep. I said, all dynamics are relative, equals, but some are more relative than others. He says, if you don't declare what you want, the player will play what he or she wants, and it will inevitably be not what you want. So there's, there's a very good lesson. Another lesson I had once is I wrote an orchestra piece, and I still remember in the viola parts at one point, it was, a, I don't know, eight or ten measures of a sustained pitch. And I don't remember which one of my teachers it was, but the teacher just said, you better do something with that. And I said, what do you mean? He says, if you ask a string player to play a note for, I don't know, 16, 20 beats, and you don't change the dynamic, you don't put in a crescendo or decrescendo, you don't do something with it, they will. You cannot have those, that many naked notes. And so this is just good practical education, you know, teaching you how to make sure you let the clarinetist breathe, how to make sure a singer can be prepared for the next pitch if it's a difficult pitch to find. You learn, you know, you learn the brass tacks. But, uh, but, but the, the best teachers are the ones, just the way a conductor can divine how she wants a piece of music to go, a good composition teacher can divine what his or her student is thinking about and then helps lead that student where the student needs to go and can be a, can be a cheerleader when necessary and can be a critic when necessary, but always a benevolent one. I really believe in that. I believe in nurturing students, and the best teachers are good nurturers. The study of music, in Bach's time, to Mozart's time, to Beethoven, to Chopin, I've noticed that everyone once in a while has released a treatise on harmony. Tchaikovsky had some notes on harmony, uh, Paul Hindemith, Walter Piston, um, but... If if you looked at a book of harmony back in like say Mozart's time, does music improve linearly? Is all of that stuff still valid? And or are things like do we look back at stuff? Oh, they just got that wrong, or is it just or is it all still relevant today? I see the development of music, uh, the music language, two different ways. Expressively, we are no better off now than we were eight hundred years ago. You know, we're human beings. Uh, our arts, our societies are cyclical, but our technology improves. And to the degree that there's improvement in music, uh, the language has become more complex. There's more syntax available today. You know, we're not better than Mozart, God knows, <laughs> but we have, more syn- we have more syntax to draw on. And that's because it's cumulative. You can't avoid it. As soon as someone adds something new to the language, you have more words, more vocabulary in the language. So the grammar has developed. And I think that's what you're talking about. Let's say the grammar of harmony as it existed in Mozart's time. And by the way, as far as I'm concerned, harmony books are nothing but uh, cookbooks. They're just recipes. And uh, all they do is, is identify what happens when you put this, this, and this together. Ultimately, it's in the ear of a composer to... To, to render this into real music. What's the best way to learn harmony, Dr. Greenberg? Uh, listen to a lot of music and then sit down blank. The same way we learn how to play jazz, we listen to music. Uh, you read scores, and then you sit down in front of your own blank page, and, you, and either you hear it or you don't. 
you know, it's, it's terrifically hard, isn't it? I mean, how, do I, how am I supposed to know this stuff? You, you have to know it. One good way to do it, when I used to teach composition, especially to undergraduates who need to be rooted, is you, you take a Chopin prelude, uh, you take a Bach chorale, uh, I'm, and I'm talking, these are very varied kinds of pieces, but you take a short piece written by someone who really knew what he was doing, and you tell them, all right, put as many measures on your music paper. I want you to write a piece of music that does the same thing harmonically, but something completely different thematically. You imitate. You imitate. I mean, that's the only way to learn is, is through imitation. And that's how we build the edifice of our own knowledge based on the music of the past. And then, having done that enough over enough years, having filled up enough notebooks with all this crap, then, then you just start on your own blank page. But, uh, but without imitation, nothing, nothing, no progress can be made. And I, I think, and now I'm going to... Now I'm going to get a little lectury, not do to it. you, but just in general. No, do it. Well, I think some of the damage we've done to ourselves as artists in the 20th century and then here in the 21st is that we think we should create everything from scratch all the time. You know, part of the breakdown of the tonal system in the early 20th century was that <clears throat> expression is not just contextual. The musical language itself is contextual. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want. Part of the problem with that breakdown is we don't study the past the way we should because we think we've cut, been cut off from the past. We should be creating our own languages. I have heard more musical charlatanism in new music concerts in my lifetime than I think anyone has ever heard. I mean, kids, students call themselves composers now. They can't put together, but they say, oh, but this is expressive of blah, blah, blah. Their program notes are magnificent examples of, of, of validation, and the music is not music. They don't know what they're doing. Now, that's a great segue. So there's a wonderful interview with you and William Shatner, and he asks you a very valid question. He says, I'm afraid to say that I don't like this piece because somebody will say that I don't know anything or... Most people, when they listen to Mozart or Bach, they say, that's music. I can get it. I understand it. But when you get into the 20th century, it's a lot more difficult for, for many people because they hear sudden blasts of timbre, sudden squeaky noises, and they say, wait a second, what's going on here? They don't want to appear uneducated in music. So how do you assuage people to, to be critical and also you know, to, to kind of go with their gut feelings sometimes if something doesn't agree with them? Well, the, and see, that's a great question, because, but it's, of course, two different questions. First of all, we understand Mozart because Mozart speaking a language that was firmly established 200 years before he was born and kept being spoken by almost everybody for another 150 years after he died or another 130 years after he died. The tonal language was like the English language, a language that we all spoke. Yes, as we go through time, vocabulary changes and, and idioms my change, but, you know, Bach could still understand a piece of music as music that had been written by Brahms 200 years later. But all bets are off now. All bets are off, because if you're creating your own language, um, it, it could be a Tower of Babel situation where everyone could be speaking quite beautifully to him or herself, but no one else can understand you. And this is a huge challenge in, in the musical arts today in composition. Now, I'd like to think, for example, in my music, that a compelling rhythmic surface and an enough good pitch information will kind of drag my listener through. But what Shatner was talking about, as you've just expressed it, is, is absolutely legitimate. And, um, but, but here's the other side of it. I don't know if you're a drinker. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> okay, sadly, at my age, I've become one. Um, <laughs> well, because there's just certain pleasures that that are unavoidable in life. If you want to, it's if healthy you want to in it. moderation. That's you know, that's what they say. Yeah, exactly. And but my my point is, if you give a 16 year old kid a really great bourbon or single malt scotch, they'll spit it out and blah, <laughs> and blah. And you know what? They're right. They're right. It is poison, and 
given that they don't know anything about it and that they're young and they can't, they can't contextualize these tastes, all you, all you taste is the yucky. But over time and context, and you learn what a pleasure this can be and the nuances of difference. And that's part of the problem of reacting too quickly to something you think you don't like because you just don't like it now because you don't know anything about it. And so much 20th century music and 21st century music is wonderful. I mean, just so life-enhancing and so fantastic. Well, your music, uh, Dr. Greenberg, you are a great composer. And, and I mean, Thank you. I, I was, was researching for this interview. I said, I got to listen to his, his work now. I, never mind the great work that you've done with the great courses. There was one piece that I was listening to. Um, I think it's Invasive Species. And I was like, no, this, is, like it, yeah. this is great. I mean, this is great. If I could tie that back to the great courses, it works because, you know, you're a composer. And one thing that I want to segue to is you don't mind taking shots at the weaker moments of composers. And I remember, I'll always remember this. There was a time you were talking about Tchaikovsky. And I think you were talking about the 1812 Overture, and you said... Oh, that transition. And you said, yeah, that transition. <laughs> you said, and I love this, because for one, it, it allows me to understand that, yeah, you know, they can... Not everything is, is Disney. Not everything is perfect. You could actually have weaker sections in music. And you took him to task, and I like that. And I think it's only due to the fact that you're a composer that you would understand where things are effective and where things are not. I happen to agree with that, and of course, my musicologist friends will, will you know, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll shoot rubber bands at me because that's <laughs> what they do. You know, it's the most damage they can do. But when I look at a piece of music, I'm always thinking, why these pitches? Why these rhythms? Why these choices? Because that's what a piece of music is. It's a series of sonic choices that are made in order to tell a story. I mean, when an author looks at another author's work, the author is thinking the same thing. Why are you telling this story here? Why this character? Why, why did you choose this situation? Because these are the questions you ask, ultimately, to A, understand what's being done, and B, figure out if there's anything worth stealing for your own work. Because <laughs> we're all, listen, it's all petty larceny all the time. You know, yeah. we're always on the lookout for something to, to slip in our pocket and take home with us and use. Everyone takes from everybody. I mean, it's the oldest line in the book <laughs> that it, uh, is it, is it talent borrows and genius steals. That's what you have to do. You know, you asked me before what you do. I, I said you take a Bach, a, a Bach chorale or a Chopin prelude and you write one of your own using, using the, that composer's harmonic progression. That's how you do it. You incorporate what's been done and you get enough vocabulary until you can start doing your own. You know, I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm very happy when I, I, I hate prodigies, by the way. I don't believe in prodigies. I, under, I understand that prodigies can be performers. But guess what? As far as I'm concerned, there's never been a 16-year-old novelist who wrote a great novel. And for all of the talk about these little children who write operas and these little children who do this and that, it's all entirely derivative. They're simply using someone else's language, someone else's stuff, and figuring out a way to, to blend it together into some kind of musical smoothie that they can then pour in a glass and claim as theirs. And I think that's fine. That's how we learn. But I think that the public overreacts to these children who can do things like that. Because real creative work doesn't happen until you've mastered yourself. And we don't master ourselves until we have at least gotten enough life experience to get through puberty and preferably a little longer. I just want to end off with a couple of really fun, fast questions, and let's just do like rapid fire. So let's really do these. So name your top three pianists. Oh, you're asking hard questions. <laughs> three, just three. Maurizio Pollini, Martha Agarich, and oh, I love them all, dude. <laughs> Uh, all right, Maurizio Pollini, Martha Agarich, and Garrick Olson. Top three jazz pianists. In no particular order, Dave McKenna, Chick Corea, Oscar Peterson. Okay, uh, top three 20th century composers. Stravinsky, Schoenberg, Bartok. Top three romantic composers. Mahler, Tchaikovsky. Oh, there's so many to choose from. Schumann. Okay. Uh, no, I, no, no, stop, stop. Hold the press. <laughs> Mahler, Brahms, 
Tchaikovsky. What's your favorite instrument to write for? Piano. Favorite orchestral timbre instrument? Don't have one. Virtually impossible. Impossible to say. Favorite format to write for? Chamber music. Any particular organization? I, again, this is where I am right now, where my head is right now. But I'm, I'm really enjoying writing pieces for piano and some combination. So whether it's a piano quintet, like Invasive Species, which you just heard, uh, a piano a trio, which I just finished and will be premiered in April. I really enjoy writing for strings and, or winds and piano. If you could get any composer, alive or dead, right now in a room and just have coffee or a drink with that composer and talk about music, and you could ask them questions for an hour, who would that composer be? Mozart, Mozart, and Mozart. And uh, what would you ask him? I'd ask him, you, first of all, how do you want your martini? <laughs> <laughs> you want it dry, you want it wet, you want it dirty, do you want olives, do you want a twist? He would be the happiest person in the world. I would say, how would you like to try and play a big piano? Because I have a Steinway D in my studio. Yep. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I would just, I would, the guy was a great raconteur. He told a wonderful joke. He, of course, would sit down and play for as long as you wanted him to. His English was impeccable. He spent a lot of his childhood in London and was excellent with languages. So I would just hang. <laughs> I, I would just hang with him. and I just let him talk. I just think being around someone like that, you don't even have to talk about music, just the way he, the way he perceives the world, the way he would address. I would love to see the way he would address the keyboard, yeah. you know, what his hands would look like when he put them on the, on the keys. Anything. I, you know, I don't think you need to talk about music with anybody <laughs> to get an amazing musical education from them because music's an extension of the person. So I would just, I would just love to be with Mozart. Okay, for people interested in your music, Dr. Greenberg, can you recommend three works for them to start with? Well, the works that I would recommend are the ones that could be seen on YouTube, of course. So there's a piece called, as you said, there's Invasive Species. Uh, let me see, there's a piece called... Um, what is that called? I forgot the name of it entirely. Oh, you see, you, you put me on the spot, and I've got to remember. There's a piece called Funny Like a Monkey, which yep. is a piano quartet. Uh, there's a piece called Lemurs uh, Are Afraid of Fusas for cello and piano that I was really happy with. And I think uh, let's end off with this final question. You told Larry King, you said music of the last 250 years is frankly contemporary music. Can you elaborate on that sentence? My dad, God bless him, just passed away last year. He was 92 years old. So three of my father's lifetimes back to back. Someone's born, they die, born, die, born, my dad, okay? So three times 92 is 276 years. That's three consecutive human lifetimes. 276 years ago, it was 1743. In 1743, Johann Sebastian Bach was hard at work in Leipzig writing his Goldberg variations. He, at that time, would have been 58 years old. In 1743, uh, Haydn was 11 years old. George Washington was 11 years old and presumably chopping down cherry trees. In 1743, Mozart is not going to be born for another 13 years. And in 1743, Beethoven's mother... Anna Magdalena Keverich had not been born yet three lifetimes ago. And it encompasses virtually the, the entire repertoire as we understand it. This is all contemporary. This is all stuff that happened yesterday, not just by geologic standards, but even by human standards. And the people of those days were just like us. So this tendency in our world today to think we've cornered the market on on change and on contemporary, we, we, we're foolish. We're foolish. We're throwing out the cultural and spiritual bathwater of our culture uh, by being arrogant and chauvinistic. And we really do need to accept that this extraordinary music belongs to all of us and is relevant to us here. And I would say, if you want an introduction to this contemporary music, please go and check out Dr. Greenberg's The Great Courses, all his lectures. I mean, that's what you give. I mean, if you, if you have kids, I mean, don't, I would say, before you force them to take piano lessons, buy this and let them have a good time and enjoy it because 
There's no stress. You get to enjoy all the great music, and really, the analysis is spot on. It's insightful. It's from a real composer who's telling you about other composers. He can explain the music to you that's in an accessible way, and it's also very high level too. So it, it goes. Anybody who's a beginner can understand it, and even someone who's advanced will get plenty out of it. And it will cost you way less than spending thousands in a, in a call. I mean, I've learned that lesson. So. <laughs> I have to say, Nikhil, the highest compliment I can be paid is when a fellow musician says, I got a lot out of this. And the best mail I get, and I do get mail, I get mail from from conductors and from musicians. I mean, uh, you know, it's David Sinkel, the, the cellist who played in the Julie, uh, it, rather in the Emerson Quartet for a million years. Uh, we became friends because he loved my courses. So, you know, th- that's the most gratifying thing of all. When fellow pros say, I can get something out of this. Uh, by the way, Dr. Greenberg, any, uh, is there a project you want to plug for 2019 that you've been recording or anything? Well, I would like to plug a couple of things, if I might. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, would love, I would love you to let everyone know that all of my courses are for sale, uh, for download from my website. I've partnered with the great courses, so I'm a selling agent of all my own courses. <clears throat> and on my website, you can get a lot of information about them. You can sample them. And if you buy them from me, you get all of the written materials as well. If you buy them from Amazon, you do not. And I would also mention to you that I'm now blogging and reviewing and vlogging two to three days a week on a platform called Patreon. It's a subscription platform, so, you know, you have to sign up for a couple of bucks a month. But um, I'm doing uh, – this is where I'm putting a lot of my energies right now. And uh, I would say I'm posting between three and 5,000 words a week. And uh, I'd like to make that more of my future. So it's worth checking out. I think my address is – it's patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music. And I would ask you to check it out. Well, the great Dr. Robert Greenberg, everybody, check out his Patreon and check out his work on the great courses and his original music. I highly recommend it. Dr. Greenberg, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Nikhil. Thanks so much for listening to my interview with the wonderful Dr. Robert Greenberg, truly one of the most important music educators around and a really fantastic guest. Please consider supporting the show on Patreon and sign up to my email list on NikhilHogan.com for updates on my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music. I really believe in this show and I hope you can share these interviews on social media so that we can get more attention and attract more great guests. Thanks again for listening and I'll see you at the next show.